Good evening and welcome to the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. My name is Ben and I'm a senior politics major here at St. Anselm College. Tonight I'll be introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Peter Levine. Dr. Levine is the Lincoln Filene Professor of Citizenship and Public Affairs and Director of CIRCLE, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement. His primary appointment is in Tufts University's Jonathan Tisch College of Citizenship and Public Service. Dr. Levine graduated from Yale in 1989 with a degree in philosophy. He studied philosophy at Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship, receiving his doctorate in 1992. From 1991 until 1993, he was a research associate at Common Cause. In the late 1990s, he also served as the deputy director of the National Commission on Civic Renewal. Dr. Levine is the author of the forthcoming book, We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, The Philosophy and Practice of Civic Renewal. He has also authored numerous other books, including Reforming the Humanities, Literature and Ethics from Dante Through Modern Times, and The Future of Democracy, Developing the Next Generation of American Citizens. He has served on the boards of steering committees of America Speaks, Street Law, the Newspaper Association of America Foundation, the Campaign for the Civic Mission of Schools, the Kettering Foundation, the American Bar Association's Committee for Public Education, the Paul J. Asher Foundation, and the Deliberative Democracy Consortium. Please join me in welcoming Dr. P. Levine. Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming tonight. I, I uh, understand that this is a, an excellent audience, which means that it would be kind of a waste if I did all the talking. So, um, and I feel that uh, this is a little formal, so I hope you will not be sort of put off by the formality of it, but we'll jump in. I have some um, remarks. I have a fair number of remarks here, but um, I'd love to make this interactive if, if you're willing. So just uh, I'll be scanning the audience and just jump in and with questions or comments or disagreements. That would be particularly exciting, actually, if you, if you disagreed. Um, I'm going to talk about citizenship. I'm going to give a kind of a brief definition of the way I see good citizenship at the beginning. And then I'm going to try to make an argument that um, we need it, that we need a lot more good citizenship in America, and that, in fact, it would solve some of our, it's the only thing that would solve some of our most serious problems. So that's really all I'm going to do. But um, I'm going to break that down into some pieces. But I'm just going to talk about citizenship and why we need it. There's, I guess I'll say there's a lot of other things we could talk about, and maybe you want to bring these things up, um, either talk about it yourself or ask me, for example, how are we going to get more citizenship, which I'm not really going to talk about, um, just for lack of time. So there's, so there's a lot of other things we could talk about. But let me start with my, my definition. It has a few parts to it. Um, by the way, I actually realized when I saw the poster for this talk that I'm going to talk about what it says on the poster, which is surprising to me because usually I say what I'm going to talk about long in advance, then I do something else, and then I show up and I realize that it's kind of a bait and switch, but I'm actually doing what it says on the poster. So, um, so here's the definition. First of all, good citizens deliberate. So we talk. We listen to other people, including people who are different from us. And why do we do that? So that we can enlarge our understanding, so we can learn, so we can see where other people are coming from, so that we can be accountable to our fellow citizens for what we believe, for the consistency and of what we say, for the um, sincerity of what we say, and to build some kind of consensus. So I start with deliberation. But deliberation is not enough, in my opinion. When people merely talk and listen, Basically, they're sort of sounding off. Um, that doesn't lead to much, usually. Under certain circumstances, it might, but usually it doesn't lead to much. And also, people, when they just talk, including me, don't um, add much insight. We don't have much basis for talking. It's not that valuable. So talk is really valuable when it's married to, when it's connected to work. When we come into conversations with the experience of trying to actually do and make things in the world, and when we learn from talking to other people, lessons that we bring back to our work. And I think work is especially valuable for democracy when it's, when it's collaborative work, when it's work making things together, which can be done in the private sector or the public sector or the not-for-profit sector, but it's when we make things together. And th so that's two kind of legs to the stool. There's actually a third leg because, and I've realized this relatively recently, <laughs> took me a long time. People talk to each other and they collaborate because 
they want, typically, because they want a certain kind of relationship with other people, kind of a civic relationship, not a tight, close friendship, not a, a distant, hostile relationship either, a civic relationship where you care to a degree about the other person, even though your connection to the other person is not so intense that it's exclusive. So people go into this kind of engagement because they want that sort of relationship, I find. And also, in working that way with other people, they form this kind of relationship. And so that's the third piece, deliberation, collaboration, and civic relationships. Um, by the way, I didn't say anything about relationship with the government. And I'll just mention that because I think usually when people define citizenship, they're going to immediately start thinking about things you do, things you do, like vote or belong to juries or pay taxes or things or attitudes you have, like loyalty to this government or critical, critical opposition to the government. I think those things are important, but I don't think they're primary. I think we, the people, decide for ourselves by deliberating, collaborating, and forming relationships what kind of government we want, what kind of relationship we want with our government, and then we go and do that. So what's, what's central is our relationships with each other, and the government is just a means or a tool. We decide we want more of it, we decide we want less of it. That's something we deliberate about, but it doesn't define citizenship. So I'm going to argue for most of this tonight that we need that kind of citizenship to solve our really serious problems. Um, I'm not going to say too much about this, but I want to make a couple more points. First of all, this kind of citizenship that I'm talking about is in deep decline, in my opinion. We can talk about this later. You may disagree. It's a good t topic for debate. It's not self-evident. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. But I do think that kind of deliberation, collaboration, and relationship building is in deep decline in modern America. It's not so much that we've lost our desire for it or our motivation for it. It's that we've lost the forums and venues that allow it. On the other hand, though, we're also in a time of wonderful civic innovation when not most people, not all that many people, but at least in my calculation, a million Americans, something like that out of 300 million, are actually involved in really demanding, innovative, sophisticated civic work of this kind. That's very much about deliberation, collaboration, and relationships. So they see the need for the citizenship. They're building impressive models and practices. I strongly suspect they include um, you in this room. So I'd like to hear about that if we have time. I think that kind of work still remains scattered and local um, because it's contrary to the mainstream of popular culture, contr contr contrary to uh, what the news media expects, contrary to public policy, which doesn't really support it, and doesn't really know how to say its own name or tell its own story. So people who are involved in that kind of work are involved in it locally. They're doing Portsmouth Listens in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. They're not trying to rebuild American democracy. So what we need is to pull that kind of work together into something like a movement, which is really my big cause in my life. But um, what I want to talk about, again, is some of the problems we face in our country and why, ci why um, civic engagement of the kind I'm talking about would make a difference. I think you'll probably agree that we Americans this month and this year and this decade are in a bad mood about our nation and our public problems. Unemployment and bailouts and all kinds of repercussions of the Great Recession are on our minds, but actually our pessimistic mood started considerably before that. Um, a majority of Americans have, been, have said that they were satisfied with the nation's course briefly at the end of the first Gulf War and for a few weeks after September 11, 2001, when there were sort of effects of rallying around the flag. Otherwise, for the last 20 years, most Americans have said that they were dissatisfied with the course of of American life. I would say this is because we face an accumulation of real and profound problems. They're sometimes called wicked problems, as a, not as a slang, but as a technical term, meaning that they have certain kind of features. They're deeply entangled with each other, the problems. They're deeply divisive. Um, we, they involve values as well as behaviors and actions in the world. Um, they're embedded with things like diverse religious and philosophical commitments that people have. Um, and, they're, um, they, and they pit us against each other. They're controversial in some, some ways so that uh, solving a problem for some people would make other people worse off. 
So for those of us who identify with a particular interest or ideology, watching our opponents express themselves on TV is deeply frustrating. But for those many people who don't feel much stake in these national debates, the whole bitter controversy is itself alienating. And because our problems are complex, entangled, divisive, the status quo is actually favored in ways that professionals and well-funded special interests can exploit to block anything they don't like. What am I talking about? Let me give you some examples. And these will be familiar, but I just want to spell them out in order to say, really in order to say how serious I am about the need for better citizenship. For example, we've put 2.3 million of our own people in prison, far more than any other nation in the history of the world. China has put 1.5 million of its citizens in prison, but it has uh, more than three times as many people. It's, this is vastly, enormously expensive, $68 billion a year for the prisons themselves, forget about law enforcement courts, forget about the costs of the people who are, not, who are in jail and are therefore not working. It represents millions of tragedies and a minimum for all the people who are victims of the cr crime, but also for the people who are in the prison. And yet, it doesn't work in a, in a bare and simple way. Our homicide rate is three times as high as the rate of any other wealthy country in the world. Okay, so why? Is this entangled with something else, this problem? Sure, probably with the failure of our schools. Notice that one in 10 young men who doesn't graduate from high school is in jail. We spend more on uh, pre-K, I mean, yeah, pre-K to 12th grade education than almost any other country in the developed world, yet fully one-third, just almost one-third of our young people drop out before they complete high school. And of course, completing high school is not nearly enough in the current economy. Well, one of the reasons that, uh, that high school, that, that educational outcomes in general are not very good is that the kids in our schools are not very healthy. Um, our population is strikingly unhealthy, and yet we spend more on health care per citizen than any other country in the world. And even if the Affordable Health Care Act of 2010 meets expectations, we'll still have the most expensive system in the world with some of the worst outcomes. Why do we have all this bad health? One of the reasons might be our diet. Two-thirds of American adults are either overweight or obese. We eat enormous quantities of highly processed food, rich in fat and sugar, that are subsidized by our own federal taxes, and so on. And I'll, I'll, <laughs> in case I'm making you too depressed, I'll skip some of this, but uh, a key point is that these things are, are intricately interrelated. Um, our problem, some of our problems are, seem critical or short-term and severe, like we just survived one of the worst recessions in American history, and there were no new jobs net jobs created for 10 years between 1999 and 2009. So, and maybe that will kind of seem a blip in 10 years or 20 years, we'll sort of forget about that, the Great Recession. But take a slower kind of decline. Detroit, which I visited last spring, actually, you know, its population less than half of what it was in 1950. Permanent closing of the factories and service industry that once supported factory workers. Um, Detroit's high school dropout rate is 75%. Michigan incarcerates five times as many people as it did in 1973. Michigan spends 20% of its state budget on prisons. Um, and Detroit, of course, is just one example of a rust belt that stretches from Milwaukee up to, for, from Baltimore up to Milwaukee and cuts and, and includes the, uh, the old mill towns of New England. So plainly, something's not going well. Our institutions are not working. And I think their failure is not just wasteful, it's deadly. They're not just broken, they're in some sense corrupt. Um, somehow failing to even address the problems that they were created to solve. Now, let me give you two kind of ideological views of this, both of which I think are incomplete or, or, um, or just plain out wrong. And here, please, you know, jump in and criticize me. The first one, is a kind of libert libertarian-leaning conservative diagnosis, um, which says that the problem is a bloated public sector that's doing too much and uh, suppressing and manipulating the, the market that should be, produced, should be actually solving these problems. 
Well, you know, I think we, one could and citizens should and will continue to and must debate the proper size of the government and its role. But a, a rapidly expanding government just can't be the source of the problems I've been mentioning. First of all, between 1947 and 2012, for that whole period of more than 50 years, 60 years, uh, federal revenues fluctuated up and down despite all the uh, debate and controversy about budgets. They fluctuated up and down in a narrow band of between 17% and 21% of our nation's economy. And the, the entire difference between, let's say, Mitt Romney and Barack Obama on how much government we should have is worth a couple percent of GDP. What has changed is the nature of federal regulation and activism. Forty years ago, the national government was involved directly in welfare, running welfare programs. It was involved directly in school integration, ordering busing. It was drafting many young men to fight in an unpopular and deadly war. And it was directly regulating all the financial markets because those were basically stock and bond exchanges. And in all those ways, it has retreated from the rest of society. Okay, so that, I mean, please uh, save up your, your uh, critical responses or give them to me now. But I'm just saying, I don't think the libertarian leaning conservative diagnosis will work. But I also don't think a kind of good government liberal response will work. That, th that response says, well, our, pr problems, our, our problem is that government has actually been corrupted, corrupted by the private sector, corrupted by private interests that spend money on campaigns and elections. I'm sympathetic to that argument. I worked for two years full time for Common Cause lobbying for campaign finance reform. But I think it's much too narrow and partial. Um, the, that kind of corruption that in, is involved in spending vast amounts of money to influence campaigns is much more pervasive and doesn't just involve the government at all. So consider, for example, that Wall Street, the financial sector, which is supposed to be um, allocating resources to the most productive purposes in society, grew from just 1.5% 1 1 of the economy, tiny little slice of the economy kind of steering it, to uh, occupying 8% of the economy in 2008. A sure sign, along with all the Wall Street bonuses and other blatant evidence, that this sector is seizing value for itself and not allocating it productively. But let me give you a different kind of example. In 1970, just one in 20 guys at Harvard University, male undergraduates at Harvard University, wanted to go to work for Wall Street. In 2007, 58% of an outright majority of, of Harvard's undergraduate men, because that's the best comparison, men to men, were heading to jobs in the financial industry. So I think we need something like Wall Street. We need a financial industry. We need some smart people to work there. But when an outright majority of the graduates of America's most famous university all want to work on Wall Street, something's wrong. Financial market is absorbing too much of our talent, somehow offering excessive rewards and perverting the other institutions. I mean, why should Harvard have an English department and a biology department and, um, if it's basically just sending people to Wall Street? So one kind of response to all this would be legal or political reform. You know, reform the, the, the financial markets by regulating them. Um, Perform, reform the schools by good quality school reform. Um, change the prison, the incarceration crisis by changing uh, sentencing laws. But I don't think so. I don't think so because, first of all, we lack the political will to do anything difficult. I mean, right now we've just reelected a president who couldn't say this on the campaign trail but whose real agenda, I think, is simply to consolidate the um, policy reforms that he accomplished or did um, in the first four years of his presidency because there's no possibility of any substantial uh, legislative change afterwards. So um, it seems highly unlikely that any other president would be in a position to do anything particularly more dramatic than that. Also, even if we could do that, even if we had the political will, do we actually know the answer is, do we actually know how we would do um, school reform or prison reform in a way that would make them work better? Some of our school systems have plenty of money, that they, and yet they still produce high proportions of dropouts. We could change our criminal penalties, but that wouldn't stop individuals from committing violent crimes and victimizing others. We can provide better health insurance 
by law, but if not enough doctors want to provide primary care to low-income residents, insurance won't help. So to make our schools, our neighborhoods, our hospitals, our police departments, our public institutions in general work better, we need to get inside them, and we need the people who are in them to make them better. It's not enough to just change the rules or provide more money. I'm going to talk a little about how you can actually do that, but let me, let me give an example um, in order to try to make my, my case a little more plausible. So the example that haunts me because my um, wife and kids were in it is the public school system of Washington, D.C. My wife was a public school teacher there, and my kids attended that school district. And, both, and all of them did fine and had a good experience, but we observed the school district pretty closely. The outcomes are terrible. Less than half of, of uh, kids graduate. Some of them will graduate or get GEDs later, but at, at the time, by the time they're 18 or 19, only about half are graduating. Spending per student is high, about $13,000, but the actual services delivered in the schools are very poor, and a lot of it has to do with money disappearing somehow between the central office and the classroom. So $13,000 spent per kid um, by the school district, about 5000 actually spent on stuff that has to do with the kids. Many of the schools are chaotic and sporadically violent, and if you follow it closely, you, you read periodically about startling examples of bureaucratic failure, like warehouses full of books that were never distributed, or payroll systems that can't keep track of the employees. There are definitely excellent teachers. There are teachers who are much more skillful and dedicated than I would be, but the system they're operating in is, a, is dysfunctional. Well, once again, is it just the schools? No, because look at the context outside the schools. Uh, the infant mortality rate in the district is twice as high as in the United States as a whole. Um, more than a third of the kids in the school system entered the school system obese at the time they come in. The death rate of for teenagers is twice as high as in the U.S. as a whole, and so on. And all these problems can be seen as, as closely in, um, connected. There's also a question of kind of motivation motivation to participate with the school system, which can lead us to different sort of diagnosis. So you could ask, why should a kid entering the DC public schools actually align himself or herself with the schools and what it wants out of them? Um, there's, there was a great series in the Washington Post some time ago about um, kids at Coolidge High School, which is a city high school that I know a little bit. And uh, it, it portrayed one young man, Jonathan, who um, is smart who has supportive parents, but who is rarely in school and is aiming for Ds and to just graduate. And she, uh, the author um, writes, Jonathan walks towards the cafeteria doors. A question follows him. If you want to make your mother proud, if you know you can do the work, if you swear to everybody you see that you want to graduate, why don't you go to class? Jonathan stares silently for a few moments. I don't know, he says quietly. I really don't know. Well, I don't know either, but I think that 50 years ago, there was a kind of straightforward answer to why you would go. The reason, then, the reason is that then there were about 35,000 industrial jobs in the District of Columbia. Um, and if you made it through that the District of Columbia Public Schools, you could get one. Uh, most adults in the city held working class jobs, often working for the federal government, at, sort of in blue collar positions. And what they were trained to do was to collaborate with other people from similar backgrounds, with middle class authority figures kind of off in the distance, keeping an eye on them. It was an orderly world with a reasonable social contract. You did what you were, what you were asked to do, and you received a paycheck. So work life was a continuation of classroom life, with the foreman and the um, office managers replacing the teachers and the principals you'd had in high school. Skills were concrete and you could learn them on the job. You didn't actually have to learn them in high school. And a big anonymous sort of boring but regulated high school like Coolidge served the purposes for which it had been designed. Youth had a culture inside the school which was unto themselves. They had kind of solidarity with themselves, limited deference to teachers who were kind of going blah, blah, blah off the stage. But if you didn't mess with them and they didn't mess with you. You came out and you got a job and, um, and the social contract was complete. Today only about 3% of the city's jobs are, are really um, 
available for people who have only a high school diploma. More than half of the city's jobs are for people classified as management and professional. Uh, and that's actually, you might be saying, well, that's D.C. where the federal government operates, but it's actually not far, far off from the national ratio. So if you can obtain credentials and skills for the business and professional world, you have wide opportunities now. S sex, skin color, age, less profound obstacles than they once were. But it's a very long way from, Coolidge's high, from Coolidge High School to the professional world. The curriculum is far too easy to prepare kids for college. There are few role models in the community. There are just few jobs. And it's unrealistic that most teenagers will be self-disciplined enough to delay gratification and get themselves through a school like Coolidge. Even if they do, the benefits will be hard to see. If most other students basically doubt the social contract and do not want to participate, it's difficult for any individual student to comply. Jonathan's not going to get an education by being the only person to show up in his class. All right. So could we solve this with some kind of reform in the schools? Well, part of the reason I bring up Washington, D.C. is because during the last decade, it underwent two gigantic reform experiments. And to me, they just illustrate why, how we don't know how to fix problems through top-down reform. So first of all, charters. Uh, you know, charters are sort of startup little schools, not controlled by the city bureaucracy, should be an end run around all that waste and corruption. They're, they're allowed to flourish in Washington, D.C. One third of all the city's kids now go to charters. So whatever you think of charter schools, pro or con, huge, um, huge reform. Beginning of the decade, nobody's in a charter, or 15 years ago, nobody's in the charter. Now, one third of all the kids in the school of Washington are in charter schools. And the result, at best, very, very barely and difficult to detect improvements. But a lot of people think no improvements at all. The other solution, kind of different from it, parallel to it, was a, a strict top-down cleanup. You know, Michelle Ree, the chancellor of, of the DC public schools, famous for being photographed on the cover of Time magazine with a broom sweeping out all the mess. So she had a different view, really. The charter school's going on on one side, and I think she was for it, but she had a different view, which is get rid of the bureaucracy, get rid of the waste, get rid of the corruption, and put highly competent teachers in every classroom. So fire teachers who aren't competent, but reward teachers who are, and um, that's everything. In fact, so in fact, she said openly, quote, cooperation, collaboration, and consensus building are way overrated. What she was interested in was good management, get the person who delivers the service, who's the teacher, into the classroom, case closed. Well, there's some evidence, actually, that teachers matter which you know, any of us who's, for example, married to a teacher should, should be quick to say. Teachers matter. Good teachers do a better job than bad teachers. And yet, it's far from clear that a leader like Michelle Ree can just cause a better teacher to appear in a classroom where she's needed most and persuade the teacher to remain there year after year through better management. Urban teaching's a deeply frustrating job if the social context is difficult if the t t motivations of the students and their families are misaligned with the goals of the schools, if there aren't any jobs for high school graduates, if it's dangerous. I've personally known teachers who were reassigned to more difficult schools in DC because they were good teachers and they were needed in the more difficult schools who immediately responded by quitting and moving to the suburbs. So I don't believe you could do it. You could fix the schools through top-down reform. But if it could work, certainly the chancellor Michelle Ree would have needed political support to do it. She would have needed the people behind her. And for a while, she had the patron in the, in the mayor. But Mayor Adrian Fenty was defeated after one term in office in a Democratic primary in which the teachers' union spent $1 million against him. And voters who were teachers or relatives or sympathizers of teachers clearly played a large role. They were trying to get rid of Michelle Ree and her broom, and they voted in the Democratic primary and got rid of her patron. Just 12% of the city's population turned out to vote that year. So when Ree is asked afterwards what happened, she blames her own failure to communicate the great things that are happening to voters. She seems to acknowledge that leaders must pay attention to the people because voters ultimately rule. She does not say that democracy is a good thing. In fact, a low turnout primary election in which private money plays a substantial role doesn't seem to me to be a very good way to assess and change public policies. So if Civic engagement means 
voting and spending money on campaigns, then you could, you could sympathize with a leader who thinks that collaboration is overrated. But assume that the chancellor's strategy worked better than anything else we can think of. Assume that by firing bad teachers and streamlining administrative procedures in the teeth of self-interested opposition, she could have proved test scores and graduation rates. The teachers, those teachers' impact is limited to the classroom and the school day. It can't possibly be profound enough to address crises in the broader society, from obesity that the kids bring into school, to violence, to a lack of jobs. Um, so, it wasn't going to work. Now, a previous mayor, the, the previous mayor right before Adrian Fenty was Anthony Williams, and he had actually introduced a different way for citizens of the District of Columbia to discuss and shape policy. He, he convened large citizen summits in, actually in the DC Convention Center. Thousands of DC residents gathered, and um, they discussed public policy every, every year. Now, um, and, and, and came up with, a plan, with plans and influenced plans for the city to work with um, the schools. The, the quality of the civic life in a community makes at least as much difference to the outcome for the kids as things like, um, as things like wealth. So um, for one thing, you can see this at the national level where uh, states and communities where parents and other members of the community are more involved in schools do much better. But you can also see it if you look closely at different poor and, um, and sort of challenged communities. So the story that I wanted to tell actually is of the difference between Youngstown, uh, Ohio, and Allentown, Pennsylvania. And this comes straight from a book by a guy called Sean Safford called Why the um, Garden Club Couldn't Save Youngstown. And it's a, it's a great book, a fairly recent book. And it looks at these two cities, which were basically indistinguishable economically and demographically when the steel crisis hit. So two cities of about the same size with the same demographics, both dominated by the steel industry. Um, but they've had completely different stories since then. Youngstown entered basically a kind of death spiral. It now has um, median household income of just $25,000, you know, for the whole family. Um, home, the median home in the whole county is worth $52,000. They have um, terrible, for example, um, homicide rates. Uh, their, even their life expectancy is quite a few years shorter than it is in Allentown, where everything is better. Okay, I'm just simplifying, but three times, the houses are worth three times as much. These are two cities with the same, that entered the steel crisis at the same point. They both lost all their steel jobs. Um, but Allentown has basically retooled and Youngstown has not. What's the difference? Both had the same kind of economic networks. They both had the same kind of businesses and they, both had the, they were both organized in the same kind of way with the sort of local business elite meeting in the same kind of clubs, uh, belonging to the same number of families in both places, the families somewhat intermarried in both places. And both had some civic stuff going on. They both had museums and clubs and stuff. But only Allentown had a robust civic network, which was a set of places and organizations where people who were involved, whether they were business leaders or union leaders or church leaders, could meet to plan and collaborate. So in Youngstown, where they didn't have that network, all they had was the, basically the ec economic elite who gathered in places like the business club. When the economic ec elite was shattered by the closing of the mills, lost its civic infrastructure too, and it's just gone. Whereas in Allentown, where they had the civic infrastructure, they retooled. So the, you know, the business leaders reorganized themselves as the Ben Franklin Technology Partnership, whatever that is exactly, but it incubated all kinds of high-tech um, industry. Meanwhile, the kind of grassroots and often lefty union-based organizations, they organized themselves into the Community Action Coalition, and the two groups negotiated and came into basically harmony about um, development strategies. So in Allentown, you get uh, profound civic success, and in Youngstown, you get failure, and the difference is actually the way that people deliberate, collaborate, and relate. And we've looked more generally at, in a study where we looked at all uh, the count, how many counties are there in the United States? I have it written down here. Um, all the counties in the United States and all the cities and all the um, large metro areas, and we put them in a statistical model, and we find that those uh, communities that had a stronger civic infrastructure at the beginning of this great recession 
uh, lost considerably fewer jobs than those that had weak civic infrastructures. And, you know, these benefits are not just, I keep on talking about economics and I keep on citing dollar figures, but the benefits are quite broad. I mean, people actually live longer in Allentown than they live in Youngstown today. So that's about as, um, that's about as tangible and human an impact as you could have. And people are happier. There's a whole separate set of research, which I won't summarize, that finds that when people are involved with each other in civic relationships, in deliberation and collaboration, um, they are happier. I wanted to talk a little about uh, incarceration, but I think I'm going to skip that in unless anybody would like to talk about it and just sort of end with some, yes. <laughs> All right, well, the, to, to put it briefly, the, the, challenge, the challenge is that, so incarceration seems like a different kind of problem because incarceration, after all, is caused by the government making a decision to put people in jail. It's connected to the fact that we also have high crime rates. But the government makes these decision to put people in jail, and um, that's the result of citizens' action in that the laws that put people in jail are generally popular, and, and um, legislators generally get... Um, elected by passing draconian sentencing laws. They don't get elected by getting rid of them. So it seems like a problem for my kind of argument, which says that reform has to come from us. We, the people, demand throwing everybody in jail and throwing away the key, and that's why we have the biggest incarceration crisis in the world. Um, so, um, so it seems like at least a paradox. But it's a little more complicated than that because when people... People behave differently in different contexts. When people um, vote, especially in a modern campaign where you see uh, campaign advertisements attacking the incumbent for being soft on crime, they vote for draconian sentences and throwing the key away. When they serve on juries, they actually differ from the judge almost always in that they are more lenient, studies show. Um, and uh, for, and again, when people vote for capital punishment up until the last few years, they've almost always voted in favor of capital punishment. But when they serve on juries, they almost always will diverge when they do diverge from court instructions by being more merciful towards the people they serve. So what's going on? Um, well, of course, juries, though, are now very rare. Um, just because we've passed all these uh, very strict sentencing Restrict, uh, laws. Um, prosecutors are in a position where they don't have to, where they can negotiate very f uh, powerfully with defendants. And so almost all cases are actually plea bargained. And so only one in 40 uh, felony cases is now actually, now actually goes to a jury trial. So what have we done? We, the people, using the ballot box, have chosen to remove we the people as jurors from the criminal justice system. Why would we do that? Well, in, back in the 1960s and before that, Americans overwhelmingly said they trusted the government. Today, hardly anyone says they trust the government. We also trust, distrust each other um, at record rates. Back in the 1950s and earlier, most people said that they generally could trust other people. Today, most people say they can't trust other people. If we trusted the government but not our fellow citizens, we'd be willing to let judges, because they represent the government, set sentences. If we trust our fellow Americans but not the government, we'd be willing to let um, the juries make the decision. But because we trust neither our fellow citizens or the government, what we do is we put um, mandatory restrictions on top of the judi judicial system. We say we want minimum sentencing laws, which are simple, understandable rules imposed on a complex system that we can't control. So we transform a criminal case from a kind of participatory uh, event at which there's fellow citizens making judgments into a bargaining session done behind the scenes by lawyers, which is a recipe for even lower trust because we can't follow the system. We know it's basically sort of corrupt because it involves bargaining. We know it's not working to cut crime. And so then we turn around and demands stricter sentences. The way to break this cycle, I think, is to get people back involved in making decisions about particular cases. And there have been, so this is where I'll definitely skip, but there have been a set of um, experiments in which people have been uh, 
brought back into the criminal justice system to make cases to make decisions about individual cases instead of instead of just deciding criminal justice policy and almost always not only are they more generally more lenient and generally more discriminating in their decisions about particular cases they also get better results in terms of actually cutting crime um, so for example are people aware of restorative justice programs they're restorative justice programs Is that anybody because if anybody is, I'd love for them to explain it instead of me just to share the space a little. Um, it, so in, in, in restorative justice programs, the, the violator, the person who, who's pled to guilty for a crime, uh, has to negotiate agreements with members of the community that the crime was committed in to repair the harms that their actions have caused. And um, restorative justice, so restorative justice gets Com uh, committees of citizens involved in the criminal justice system. And overwhelmingly, it reduces recidivism and it makes people much more trusting in the jury system. So I would argue that if we're going to solve or address the problem of, so the, the, the root of the incarceration problem is deep public distrust with, in each other and in the government. The solution that we've used so far is draconian sentencing laws. The only way to break that cycle is to get people back involved in criminal justice. There are public officials who are engaging the public in better ways um, because, because, it, because their lives are miserable. Because um, when the public deeply distrusts government and when there's scarce resources and when problems are insolvable, um, you know, public officials go around with a kick me sign on them. And so, and they're increasingly interested in trying to engage people better. So this, this um, member of the New York City Council, Brad Lander, is bringing to New York something that's happened in other cities in America, but mainly it's happened overseas in Brazil which is participatory budgeting. And actually, it's as old, really, as the New England town meeting, when you think about it. It's really the same thing in a 21st century way. So what he does is he has a, um, as a member of the city council of New York, he has a discretionary capital budget that he can use to spend, to just decide how he wants to spend. It's, it's um, millions of dollars, but it's not many millions. And he just said, I don't think I should have that, actually. Um, it's actually kind of corrupt for incumbent members of the legislature just to be able to spend money on anything they want. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the citizens of my district, but we're going to do it in a um, deliberative process. So you get to vote on what to spend the money on, but you have to first show up in a meeting at which everybody talks about what to spend the money on. And I don't control that, but I structure it. So there are, you know, so you show up and you have to sit down at a small table with a bunch of other people randomly selected, and you have to go through some ideas, and then they vote. And so that's that's one thing. And I'll just won't say much more about it except it. It's a whole field of practice where public officials are, are engaging the public more. Now, another kind of uh, trend to me is, you know, relatively, originally relatively kind of aggressive, um, controversial, grassroots-based community organizers around America, who 20 years ago would have been sort of fighting City Hall, deciding that actually they can't get anywhere with the constituencies they've got, that they're up against bigger problems than they can solve, that they need broader, um, constituencies. And so them taking on processes which involve broader and broader groups of people, more and more diverse. Um, so you see in, you know, another example I would tell the story of would be San Antonio, Texas, where the Industrial Areas Foundation starts out as a kind of lefty uh, group based only in the Mexican-American communities, in the poorest communities of the city, kind of fighting City Hall. By now, 20 years later, it's a structure for all kinds of people in the city to interact on matters of public policy and seen as relatively neutral. And the reason is self-interest in both of those cases. So I think those are two examples. They're both a little heavy on the deliberation. And so another kind of example for, for a final one um, in answer, at least to your question, would be all the kind of collaborative work that's now done around things like environmental um, restoration, management of public lands, um, all of which has much more of a hands-on work flavor to it and a little less talk but which is teaching us all kinds of lessons about how people can collaborate. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, I guess it's in some sense it's one, one relationship at a time because you're, you're, you're certainly riding against a current of, of deep skepticism about anything from anybody, but we still somehow rebuild trust one relationship at a time. To, that's, a, or, <laughs> yes. Well, I won't do it eloquently, but I do think, um, I won't be able to do it eloquently, but I do think that 
maybe the best thing I can say is I, I do this kind of talk, and this is a new, um, this, this text was new, but I do this kind of talking all the time. And everywhere I go, I was in Indiana just a couple weeks ago, there are people like this. And the conversations are sophisticated, right? I mean, these are conversations about strategy and tactics and about tools. And I think, so I think there's a lot of people in America who are onto this kind of work. And I think they really care for a variety of reasons, including that it's fun, which is perfectly fine, but for a bunch of reasons. And what they, what they need to do and what I think they will begin to do is to start to network together into something quite a bit bigger. So maybe I can leave with that. Thank you. For On behalf of the students, faculty, oh. and staff, we want to thank you for coming tonight yeah. and present you with a institute vest. Nice. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank wow. you again for coming. And it's the right season, too. It for, is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.